the Mediterranean Sea, bordered in the north and west by Europe, in the south by Africa, and in the east by Turkey, Syria, and Palestine. Palestine, the country where Jesus Christ lived. A journey down the valley of the River Jordan may help us to understand more clearly some of the things Christ said and did. North of the Jordan Valley stands Mount Hermon. Here our journey begins. We travel southwards to the things of Dan. We continue south through Lake Hula. We reach the Sea of Galilee, on the north shore of which is on the map. We are going to start near the foot of Mount Hermon. Let us set off. Here, about 30 miles from the sea coast, is Mount Hermon, where the Jordan rises, and where it is said the disciples saw Christ tread before them in a vision. From the snows that cap the mountain peak throughout most of the year, many small streams flow down through the foothills to the plains. We first see the Jordan proper at the springs of Dan, its small streams gathered into one main course. To the surrounding fertile lands, 3,000 years ago, came the Hebrew tribe of Dan, having been driven from their own country by the hostile Philistines. From Dan, the river makes its way swiftly to the south as a pleasant, rippling stream through a beautiful landscape, almost English in appearance. We meet the shepherd, taking his sheep to new pastures. He still leads them, as did shepherds in biblical days. The animals learn to trust and follow him. This countryside is typical today. A modern road bridge crosses the river. The cattle wade out into the water to drink, while the herdsmen sit lazily on the bank in the hot sun, watching that none strays too far away. The farmer is tilling his field much as his forefathers did of old, with the ox and the ass yoked together plough. Christ used such scenes in teaching simple folk, shepherds, herdsmen and farmers. Jesus knew their daily problems. A carpenter himself, he had made ploughs and yokes for their oxen. He talked of the ploughman putting his hand to the plough and of the sower planting seed in the ground. Sometimes the soil was good. More often, shallow and stony. Seven miles south of Dan, the river widens out through swamplands rife with malaria into the shallow Lake Hula. This lake is not mentioned in the Bible, but it is possible that ancient manuscripts were made from papyrus reeds which grew around the lakeside. Here, cattle and sheep are led to the still waters to drink, and here the women come down to fill their water pots and carry them back to their reed huts. Using crude rafts, the men who live at the lakeside punt their way across the water and collect bundles of reeds to bring ashore. In the hot sun, the reeds soon dry and are then split by the head of the household and the children. Using primitive hand looms, the women skillfully weave the split reeds into matting. Years of practice enable the weavers to pass the reeds over and under the warp at great speed. Though this method of weaving is thousands of years old, in principle, it is the same as that used in modern machinery. The matting is used for walls of huts, for floors and for beds. When Christ said to the sick man, Arise and take up thy bed, he referred to such a mat. At the south end, Lake Hula narrows, the waters of the Jordan flowing through 10 miles of country to the Sea of Galilee. On this stretch, feet until it is 700 feet below sea level. Here we still find the people tilling the soil, but the farmer uses more modern aids. Clumsy wooden tools have been replaced by steel farm implements, and the slowly plodding ox and ass have given way to the more agile mule.
Leaving the river and taking to the road, we come to the north end of the Sea of Galilee. This is a very interesting part of our journey, for here Christ began his ministry. By this lakeside, he often walked with his disciples and taught the crowds. Here, traditionally, he fed the multitudes with loaves and fishes that a boy brought with him. Near the lake stands the Mount of Beatitudes, where Christ preached his great Sermon on the Mount. To the north is all that remains of the ancient town of Capernaum. In Christ's day, a flourishing lakeside port where he discovered Matthew collecting taxes and called him to be a disciple. In more recent times, the monks have reconstructed the ancient synagogue in which Christ preached. It was originally built by a centurion of the Roman garrison. Notice the Roman influence in the general construction the sculptured stonework of the pillars, and the five-pointed star of David, the symbol of the Jewish religion. Around this part of the lake, the wind often sweeps down suddenly from the northern hills, and very quickly the peaceful waters become stormy, but the storms depart as quickly as they come, leaving the waters placid and peaceful again. We recall how Christ's disciples were afraid of being wrecked in one of these sudden storms, but he awoke from his sleep in their boat and stilled the troubled waters. Here also he taught and healed the sick. Today the fishermen still carry on their work as their forefathers did in the time of Christ, fishing from their boats. And near the shore, using the ancient throw net, which is carefully folded so that it opens out as it flies through the air. Casting the nets requires great skill. Often these men toil for hours without making a single catch. But like fishermen the world over, they have great patience. By means of weights round the edges, the nets trap fish on the lake bottom. The fishermen eagerly inspect their catch. They place the fish in net bags, which hang from their waists. On the lake shore, we again find shepherds minding their sheep, as did David, the shepherd boy who became king of Israel. When the grass has been eaten away, they lead the flocks to new pastures, not always easy to find in the summertime. Leaving the northern end of the lake and travelling south, we come to Tiberias, the largest town in the whole of the Jordan Valley, and the only remaining one which flourished in the time of Christ. It was built by Herod Antipas, the elder son of Herod the Great, in honour of Tiberius Caesar, the Roman ruler. It was looked on by the Jews in Christ's day as a heathen city and therefore to be avoided. No mention is made of it in the New Testament. The remains of the Roman aqueduct that supplied water to the town 2,000 years ago can still be seen. We look through its historic arches at the present town. Modern Tiberius is higher up on the hillside. The old Arab part lies by the lake. Today, Tiberius is a busy little town of flat-topped houses with its domed mosque rising above the surrounding buildings. In the marketplace, the traders set out their wares and bargain for hours, while the country people bring their farm produce to be sold and buy clothing materials, pots, pans and other goods to take back to their farms. Here they gossip with the townspeople and gather news of the outside world. The marketplace was always a favourite centre, even at the time of Christ. There some hypocritical Pharisees came to say long prayers in public to impress the people with their holiness.
We pause now for a moment to see how far we've traveled and where the rest of our journey lies. The Jordan flows out of the Sea of Galilee, continues south, and with Jericho and Jerusalem to the west, enters the Dead Sea. From Galilee to the Dead Sea is about 65 miles direct, but the river meanders so that it traverses at least 200 miles. Let us take up our journey again. The Jordan leaves the Sea of Galilee as a much wider river, very different from the rippling stream that emerged from the springs of Dan. Travelers stop at the riverside to water their camels and to rest. The ever-present herdsmen with their flocks make their way along the road, always in search of fresh pastures. The sheep and goats are mingled together, just as they must have been in the time of Christ, for he referred to the separating of the sheep from the goats at the Day of Judgment. In the surrounding country, we find fertile agricultural land farmed on large-scale modern lines. The grain is reaped by a big combine harvester, which cuts the corn, threshes it and bags it as it moves along, casting out the bales of straw as it goes, while a single man at the wheel guides its powerful caterpillar tracks. Compare this with the reapers in a neighboring farm still using the ancient sickle as they did thousands of years ago when Ruth, the woman from Moab, gleaned the ears of the corn which the reapers left behind. About eight miles south of Galilee, the Jordan is joined by its main tributary, the Yarmouk, which enters through a steep and rugged gorge. Where the two rivers flow together, the waters have been dammed, making a large shallow lake which controls the flow of water. From Yarmouk to Jericho, the Jordan is almost inaccessible by road. But from overhead, we see the great bends in the river and the malarial swamps with an unhealthy tangle of thorns, tamarisks and willows on either side. The valley is almost deserted. Beyond the swamps on each side are wastes of arid land ridged by the winter rains and rising to barren mountains. This is the true wilderness, so often mentioned in the Bible, almost uninhabited and bare, haunted by scorpions, lizards and snakes, and ruled by the blazing sun. Through this type of country, the early Hebrews passed on their way from Egypt to Palestine. Only brigands and bandits lived here, hiding out amongst the mountains and descending to plunder unprotected travelers. Christ referred in his parable of the Good Samaritan to a traveler who was robbed and beaten on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is actually part of the Jerusalem-Jericho road. Today, it can be used by motors. The traffic is moving up the hill in the direction of Jerusalem. Jericho stands five miles from the Jordan at the foot of the mountains of Judea. All that remains of the city round whose walls Joshua and the Israelite army marched is the mound of Tel Es Sulta. Here the trumpeters marching round the walls sounded a fanfare. The walls collapsed, the army entered and massacred the people. Archaeologists have found traces of the flattened walls and of the destruction of the city by fire. Jericho gets its water from the walled pools of Elisha, fed by springs flowing from the earth. Here, Elisha the prophet is said to have healed the bitter water miraculously so that the people of Jericho could drink in safety, water their cattle, and irrigate the soil. These waters still flow through the town in roadside channels. In Jericho, Christ gave blind Bartimaeus his sight, and Zacchaeus, the unpopular chief tax collector, climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus over the heads of the crowd. These barren mountains may be where Christ resisted the temptations of the devil after fasting in the wilderness. Leaving Jericho, 
we first cross the stretch of arid land that borders the valley and then return to the Jordan. Across the river lie the plains of Moab, where Joshua camped before leading the Israelite army to the capture of Jericho. In this area, John the Baptist began his ministry baptizing the people in the narrow and sluggish waters of the river. This is the shrine built by Christians to commemorate the baptism of Christ. The Jordan now drags its way through the last few miles of its course to the Dead Sea, 1,300 feet below sea level. The Dead Sea is completely landlocked. Evaporation in the hot sun causes its level to remain constant. The water of this sea contains 10 times as much salt as that of other seas and oceans of the world. It is becoming more saline every day as the Jordan pours in. The salt poisons the soil. All vegetation in the area is stunted and parched. It is a wilderness. No fish can live in the Dead Sea. This is the region where the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah stood until they were destroyed by some terrible catastrophe. According to the Old Testament story, Lot's wife, fleeing from the doomed cities, looked back at the destruction of her home and was turned into a pillar of salt. Today, the salt is reclaimed from the sea and manufactured into chemicals and fertilizers. It is shoveled into trucks for removal to the factory where it is treated and transformed from the salts which poison the earth into others which make the earth fertile. Ezekiel the prophet looked forward to the day when the waters would be healed and the countryside fertile again. For thousands of years, from Mount Hermon, through Lake Hula, Sea of Galilee, town, village, plain and wilderness, the River Jordan has poured its waters into the Dead Sea. During a final look at the southern end of the Jordan Valley, we recall that the region of our journey saw the birth of Christian civilization.